Hello everyone and good morning. Welcome to discipleship class today. This is the Keja class and we're studying the book of Genesis. Last week we looked at Genesis chapter 11 from maybe verse 1 to about verse 25. Um, and some of the things we learned last week, I'll just quickly do a recap before we go into today's class. We looked at um, the story of the Tower of Babel, how the sons of men or the children of Israel decided that they wanted to build a tower that will reach up to heaven so that they can make a name for themselves and they will not be scattered all over the place. And based on that, the Lord um, came down and looked at what they were doing and he did commend their unity, but he said that it will go against what he wanted to do. So what he did was he confounded their language and put a halt to what it was that he, um, they, they had planned to do. And we began to look at the fact that um, was confounding their language punishment or was it a preventive measure? And we realized that looking at the pages of the scripture, that the Lord did what he had to do to keep them within his will. You know how God will give us assignments and after a while, because it's been long coming, we get to that point and we're thinking, well, um, God said it in, two, in 20, 2008. This is 2018. Ten years have passed and maybe God didn't mean it again or doesn't mean it again or doesn't need for me to do it again. So what we we'll usually do is we'll begin to try to recalibrate or change the things that God has called us to do. We saw last week that um, the preventive measure, that, uh, sorry, confounding the, tower, the language at the Tower of Babel was to prevent man from stepping out of God's will. Because clearly man, God has said to Noah uh, in chapter 10 that he should, um, him and his children should go up and they should produce and they should spread to the ends of the earth and they should replenish the earth. So to decide that they will stay in one place and build a tower that will touch up to heaven was contrary to what God has said he wanted to do. And based on that, what God did was that he confounded their language, which meant that um, they couldn't understand each other anymore. And so they had to, I, I have a feeling like they had to look through, you know, people had to keep going back and forth and just talking until they could gather the clusters of people who understood what the, each other. And then they went off to set up a community somewhere. Now, if we back up to chapter nine, where we did that trace, no, chapter nine at 10, actually, where we did the trace and we found that that um, from the Bible we could trace to Egypt, we could trace to Iran, we could trace to Iraq. It's, but trace is one of those things that I said that when we studied chapter 10, that every single one of us came from the same God. That we decided to fashion out different ways to reach him does not negate the fact that we, have, we are not from him. That we decided not to follow his way, his ordained way, does not mean that he did not, that we're not cut from him. Praise the Lord. I'm, st I'm talking about that because very soon you begin to hear the promised land. And what I want to point out is that the promised land, the land of Canaan, were not aliens. They were the same people that still, you can trace them all the way to Adam. Praise the Lord. But what were the things we learned last week? We learned that what man desired... If we let man, if God lets man, if God lets you have what you desire every day, it can destroy you. If not for any reason, for the mere fact that you don't see God the way everybody sees him, you, 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 the way he sees you rather, you don't know him the way he knows you. So you can sit there and think, I'm trying to follow the will of God. But the thing is that that's not where God has called you to. So if you want to push things because, oh, you are so confident that God asked you to do them or that they will add to God. You know how we help God? I'm trying to make God famous on the earth. What are you talking? We will make God famous. Is there anyone that looks around them and doesn't know that there is a God? Even if they decided that they would not acknowledge him, it doesn't mean that they don't know. It is not our job to make God famous. Because we begin to hatch plans and put together strategies and stuff like that to help God get where, get where he's going, really. God doesn't need our help. We should be grateful that he would even consider to ask us to join the, the journey. So that's the first thing that lesson. The second lesson is that what man feared most will prove to be part of his deliverance. If you just sit down and know that most of the things that you are afraid of, 
may be the things exactly that God has orchestrated to deliver you. It just helps to know that, okay, what men call punishment mm -hmm. is what God is using to refine me. His, what scripture says, for instance, it says, I have refined you in the furnace of affliction. Most of us always say, God forbid, I will not, be, I will not, be, I will not suffer affliction. Mm -hmm. But what if in a place of affliction is where you can, God can actually get your attention and hear you? Does that mean that God will deploy affliction every time because he wants to, us to hear him? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that the things that you are afraid of, if you look at them carefully through the eyes of God, if you look at, look at them with what I call throne room perspective, mm -hmm. the tendency is you will see God in another light. You will notice that what everybody is screaming and saying will kill you is not what it is. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Number three, lesson that I learned from um, Genesis 11 is that man's plans can never thwart God's purpose. So for those of us that have become the senior advocates for God, relax. There is nothing that man can do on this earth that will stop what God wants to do with us. Absolutely nothing. The plans of man as refined, as intelligent, as civilized as they are, cannot thwart the purpose of God as a cake as it sounds. Because sometimes what we think, we think that God is not moving with the times. God is still in the 1800s. God is still in the 1400s. God is still in the era, the AD era. Everything he says is old school. As civilized as you are, you still can't stop the move of God. When he's well and ready, he will get up. And he will do what he wants to do. And no man, the Bible says no man can wrestle with our God. So that's another lesson that I learned. The fourth lesson that I learned from Genesis 11 is that unity is not the highest good. Purity and obedience is. Unity is not the highest good in God. Purity and obedience is. Do you get it? Unity is not the highest good in God. Purity and obedience is. Unity must never be at the expense of obedience and purity. You know how we keep quiet and say for the sake of peace? Let it just be that we have a semblance of peace because it's never peace. Let it not be that I'm the dis discordant voice in the group so I'll keep quiet and I'll go with them. Meanwhile, before you even got to that meeting, the Lord has spoken to you and had told you something. You get there and you're thinking, oh, they are older than me. They are this than me. They are more anointed than me. They are bigger than me. They have more money than me. All the things, the measurement, measuring tapes we put on the ground that God did not put on the ground. And based on that, you decide that, oh, I'll keep quiet for the sake of unity. No. Unity can never take the place of obedience. Our journey, at, you know, as I speak, is our individual journeys. What, yes, unity is good because in Psalm 133, the Bible talks about that, that it's in that place that God commanded the blessing. I get it. But if it has to be at the expense of obeying the word of God, we have a problem. The fifth thing I saw in Genesis 11 that I'd like to share is that Babel brought confusion ultimately in the dispensation of grace or in this season that we're in acts of the acts of the apostles or pentecost brought about unification and strength again and I, I i took time last week to talk about the power of language that what happened in in in, in you know why the devil you know orchestrated for the people to not want to deploy language for themselves was because language is powerful. There is a power when people can speak in one voice. Which is a good thing. Until we decide to speak in one voice against the will and purpose of God. But that's what happened in Genesis 11. God did not let it slide forever. In Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9 to 11. He made a proclamation and said I would cause a restoration. And in Acts chapter 2 verse, verse 2 to 6. He actually manifested that res restoration. For you to know that language is about power. You will remember that when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, if I go and the spirit come upon you, then you would receive power. So there is a power. 
And the Spirit of God is the agent of unity in the way that God wants us to exhibit it. Anything outside that is not wearing the same kind of fabric that makes us a unified church. It's not singing homily every day across the globe. All of us at the same time of the day, we are saying, we are chanting the same thing. That is not what makes us a powerful body. What makes us a powerful body is that we are led by the Spirit of God. When we talk about unity in Christ, what usually happens is that people speak differently. That when you put it all together, the big picture comes together. It is the big picture that comes together. It's not uniformity. So when you expect that we have 400 campuses at 11 a.m. every Sunday morning across all 400, 400 campuses, we should all be saying, our Father, who art in heaven, we already have a problem. That's not the way God uh, operates. What God will do is we give, according to the people in the room, he will give what is required for that room. But when we all gather eventually, because those gatherings are good, and we begin to share, we'll find out that where A stopped, B continued. Where B stopped, C continued. That is what God means by oneness. Does this make sense? The sixth thing that I learned from Genesis 11 is that superficial or artificial or surface relationships and activity can never hold man together. So the assurances we do is not how we become one. Even eating from the same bowl is not how we become one. Hugging each other and saying you are blessed does not make us one. What makes us one is the capacity for all of us to submit to the spirit of God. And walk according to his dictates. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. So when you look at Genesis chapter 11. <coughs> these are some of the. Um, these are some of the things that I have seen there. That I have learned from them. In the seventh thing that I learned in Genesis chapter 11. Is that the only thing worthy of our faith. Is God's word. Not our works. In Psalm 123, the Bible says it like it says, it is in, it says the build, it says it is in vain you build the house if the Lord builds it not. The watchman waketh in vain if the Lord Himself does not watch over a city. Everything we do, if we if the Spirit of God is not in it, is a waste of our time. You might as well just have slept all day. It is God that breathes upon all that we do to make it alive and active and effective. If you want to know what I mean, do you remember if you have seen the movies or the documentaries when the, the ship, the Titanic was built, they were interviewing the person who put it all together and he said, even God cannot sink this ship. Why? Because they had taken into consideration everything that could go wrong, they thought. That ship did not last six months. So it's not in the skyscrapers. By all means, if the Lord puts skyscrapers in your heart, build it. But make sure the Lord puts it in your heart. Let it not be that you're building the skyscraper because your neighbor just built 11 stories. So you want to do 21 stories because your, your agenda is to trump your neighbor. He needs to know that you have arrived. Then it will just be another empty walk and another empty boast that does not add value. Praise Jesus. We need to recognize that toil is not our savior. God is. Because the Bible says it is in vain you wake up early and you go to bed last. It's not in any of those things that you become great. Greatness is put in you at the point that God created you and let you out. From that day, he dropped a, a seed of greatness in you. And all your life, what he does is he begins to challenge you. He begins to train you. He begins to set you apart to work out the greatness that he has put inside of you. So we don't work for greatness. We manifest the greatness that is inside of us already. Praise Jesus. In vain do men push without God. A man without God mistakes toil for work. If you remember when we looked at Genesis chapter 2, I told you that there's a difference. And Genesis chapter 3, God ordained work. The devil, the fall brought toil. 
So when God started to say, when God in Genesis chapter 2, he said to Adam, tend and keep the garden. That was work. But in Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, he said, from the sweat of your brow, will you eat? That was toy. What we do today is we miss, because we don't know the difference, we mistake toiling as the same as walking. And so you see us running, running, running. Walk is when you do what you enjoy because God ordained you to do it. Now, even the things, the best things that we do that we enjoy, they have their downsides. For me, it's that I, I can't catch a break right now to rest. Do you understand it? But what I'm doing is not, if you look at what I do Monday, uh, Tuesdays through Sundays as work, you have, as toil, you have missed it. I, I, yes, I do it. It takes me effort. It takes me hours to prepare to teach for one hour. But for me, it's not a toy. How do I know? Because in my most tired state, if you call me, I will still be able to do it. Do you understand it? But it's here, it's because we're still effectively broken down that most of man thinks that when it is difficult is when the Lord is in it. That's not the case. That it is difficult is not an, um, what's the word, is not indicative of the fact that God is in it. Work is partnership with God to bring his purposes to pass. Toil is standing on your own, trying to produce what your nature has not brought for you to produce. Work is how we partner in God, go activate the nature that he's put in us to be productive, to come to the fore. Yes, that is processed in us, but we don't sweat. It's not by the sweat of our brow. Anything that is by the sweat of your brow is indicative that something broke. Even if it is difficult in its execution, in your spirit, there ought to be a peace. Once the peace is missing, it is indicative of the fact that something had broken. And to be able to deliver the way God has called you to deliver, what are you supposed to do? Go back to God to fix what has been broken. The eighth thing that I learned in Genesis chapter 11 is that most of what man does is a monument to his fears and his insecurity. I want to have 15 cars in my garage. It's because something somewhere tells me that the more cars I own, the more qualified I am to be called a child of God. So we begin to equate material things as blessing. I've told us in this class before that material things are no blessings. Material things are utilities that God gives to us to do what he's called us to do. The, if the blessing is a car, then we have a big problem because what happens when the car crashes? If the blessing is a house, we have a major problem. What happens when the house burns down? Not that we're praying that these things happen, but there are things that happen every single day. The blessing is not something that is physical. It's a tangible presence inside of man that man carries. That's why a blessed man, wherever you throw him, would always manifest greatness. Praise Jesus. So those are some of the things that I learned from um, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 to here, yeah, about verse... Um, verse number 10 actually but let's just say verse 25 today our teaching would <coughs> will be focused on genesis chapter 11 from verse 26 to genesis chapter 12 verse 9 because now we want to begin a journey from the beginning of genesis chapter 12 uh, from the scripture um from genesis eleven twenty-six 26 all the way to genesis 50 <coughs> we'll begin to see what happens when a man walks with God. We will see the ups, we'll see the downs, we'll see the falls, we'll see the restoration. So this is for me the most interesting part of Genesis just started. Praise the Lord. So Genesis chapter 11 verse 
26. Now, <coughs> these are the gen no, verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in all of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Abraham took and Terah took Abraham. I need you to note verse 31. Mark it if you can. And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and went forth with them from all of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan and they came unto Hara and dwelt there verse 32 and the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran praise Jesus Terah is the son is um, came out of Shem praise Jesus now if you remember when their father blessed them when Noah blessed his children when he came to Shem, Terah is a descendant of Shem. When he came to Shem, in Genesis chapter 9, 26 and 27, what, Terah, uh, what Noah said was, Blessed be Shem, and Canaan shall be his Sabbath. God will enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Praise Jesus. So Terah came out of Shem. I need us to know that it will make sense as we go along. Praise Jesus. But... Shem did not have anywhere named after him. Canaan had land already. So Terah woke up one day and decided that, okay, you know what? After this, you know, because what happened after the Tower of Babel, where people kept moving and they kept occupying space and they kept moving and they kept occupying space. Abraham had three children. Abraham, uh, sorry, Terah had three children. Abraham, Nahor, and Milcah, and, and Haran. And so he decided that they would go to Canaan. Praise Jesus. So they set out to go to where? To Canaan. Now, if you read very carefully from verse 31, the Bible says, Terah took Abraham. So you will know that the first decision to move towards Canaan was not Abraham's decision. Do you get it? The Bible doesn't even say that God said it. What it says was that Terah got up. It looked like Terah just got, maybe just fed, got fed up of Lagos and decided to move to Abuja. Because he had heard that in Abuja, business booms faster. Something like that. That's the way it seems right now in the Bible. And please, the operative word that I'm using is that it seems. Now they left. But where were they headed to? They were headed into the land of Canaan. They came to Haran and they stopped. What's the first thing that I will learn here? That just because you began the journey does not mean that you will end it. And just because you didn't end the journey does not mean that God has not prepared a man to continue the journey. So Terah got to Haran and for whatever reason he settled. And before we knew what was happening, Terah died in Haran. And Terah was... 205 years old when he died in Haran. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, how does your Bible say it? If you have another version, I want to hear it. Now in Haran, the Lord said to Abraham, what version is that? The NIV. Does anybody have the message? Twelve verse one. Twelve verse one. God, God told. Yes, please. One. Yes, please. God told Abraham, "Leave your country, leave your country, 
your family okay. and your father's womb. For a land that I will show you. Okay, then I preferred King James version for this particular first part of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. He said, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham. What that means is that even before Terah died, even before they settled in Haran, God had been speaking to Abraham. I need you to, what was the instruction? Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. So possibly God started to speak to Abraham concerning this thing before Terah even decided to move. But Abraham sat down and did not praise Jesus. Until his father one day, you know, sometimes God will be trying to reach you. And because you're too distracted with great things that are happening around you, you don't hear him. Then because God's purpose will not be thwarted, remember what we said in Genesis 11. He would move because God is the greatest chess player. I don't even play chess, but I hear that chess is a game that, you know, if you can play, then you can, you can strategize, yeah? He's the greatest strategist that I know. So he had been telling Abraham, move. Abraham didn't move. So he moved Sarah. How do I know? I will show you. But let's go on. It says, get thee out of what? Thy country. If, will you please underline country? What does country mean? You know, you know in Nigeria, how many people? The, the population commission says we are about 180 million. And they've been saying this 180 million for like, 15 years. Are we not having children? Are we dying more than we are? I don't get it. But let's agree that we're, we're, we're 180 million. How many of that 180 million people do you think know me? Yet, God was very specific to Abraham. He said, come out of your country. So what that meant is, Abraham could leave Nigeria and go to Ghana. He had left his country, right? But see, that's not the end of the conversation. What did he say? From thy kindred. That's from your extended family. All your RIP come out of them too. So that you are moving to Ghana is not enough. Make sure you are not moving with all of these people with you. Then he went further and said, from your father's house. Here's the thing. What's the church called? The church is the body. What is it called? What's the Hebrew word for church? It's ecclesia. Or is it Greek word? One of those two. The word is ecclesia. What does ecclesia mean? Mean they called out, separated. They called out. You can never be all God that all that God has called you to be, if what in your mind or what in our minds this morning represents your country, you stay there. Now this does not mean in our day. It doesn't mean that I have to leave Ghana and go to Afghanistan. That's not what it is. What it means is that there is a way of life because country is about a people, it's about a culture. You can't work with God except you step out and separate yourself. But the thing that I like about verse 1 that you need to know today is that the separation is never once. Just when you think that you have separated from all my country, he says to you, what about your kindred? Then you start another level of separation. Then he looks at you and says, oh, you did very well. You are feeling cool with yourself. And he says, what about your father's house? And we'll see in the story of Abraham that even when they said his father's house and he left, he took Lot. After a while, God still separated him from that Lot. You need to recognize that when you walk to walk with God, you need to burn bridges. It is not to be un, um, uncouth and rude to people. That's not what it is. It's not to begin to say to people they are sinners because the Bible does not record that there was anything wrong with Abraham's brother, Nahor. But he was just not the one that was called on this trip. What that also presupposes that you know is that you will not get to the point where one day what you, all you are doing with your life is you are saying, um, 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 you understand that when they call you that someone may not go with you. You need to settle it in your heart that sometimes it will be just you. And that the fact that they called you out doesn't mean that every other person who is there is a bad person. It just means that they called you. 
There's absolutely nothing special about Abraham at this point. He's not been tested, nothing. There is nothing. They just called him. Just the same way when God wants to call you or when God has called you or is calling you, he doesn't need a CV. He doesn't need a resume. He calls you, then he begins to build the CV and the resume that you need to do the work. So we don't get called based on the Bible colleges we've been to. We don't get called based on whoever poured oil on us. We got called because God called us. And he can surpass everybody. He can go past everybody and pick you. If the story of Jesse and his sons is anything to consider, he went through nine children to get to David. All of them looked better as kings than David looked. But he went through all of that to get to David. Does this make sense? Praise Jesus. So he called him. He says, I call, get thee out of thy country, out of thy kindred, and out of thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. The problem with most of us is we left our country, but we have held on to our kindred. Familiar spirits. The things that are, because country is not hard to separate from. How many people know me in Nigeria? So it's not, it's no big deal. Kindred, now that is difficult. It speaks to culture. He speaks of things that I'm used to. Do you get it? Then we move away from there. He's now said to them, from your father's house. That is the people you do life together with. A day may come that the best thing for you is to step out from them. Then guess what he says? To a land that I will show you. This is the one that upsets me. It would be nice if you gave me a GPS. It would be nice if you have prepared a house for me there. It would be nice if you gave me a telephone number and an address. It would be nice if you told me who I should I will meet when I get there. There is a level of comfort that knowing that when you get to the airport at a strange place, that someone will meet you. Even if you've not met the person before, if it's your first time, but at least someone that both of you know or something is sent them to come and meet you at the airport. It just gives you some level of comfort. But Abraham was sent to a land they will show him after the fact. Who sends people to lands? How do you want me to calibrate my journey? So I just get up and I look left, right, and center. Which road is open? I just follow it. Who travels like that? No, pack your bags now and then let me ask you where are you going? Say, I don't know, I'm just going. We will not sit you down first until you find out where you are going. But with God, there are no addresses. Because in God, anywhere you end up is good, really. Anywhere you end up is fantastic. You know why it's fantastic? It's not because there will be a gigantic building waiting for you. It is just because wherever you end up, then God is there. And wherever God is, is the best place that you can be. Praise Jesus. So he was called to come out of his father's, out of his country, out of his kindred, out of his father's house, to go to a land that he will be shown. And this had been a conversation that God had been having with Abraham for years. Possibly before terror even moved. Verse number two, and I will make of thee a great nation. That's comforting. You make of me a great nation where I don't know yet. But isn't that what the journey of faith is about? To just trust that no matter what happens, wherever God stops me will be the place that I need. It will make me a great nation. It is this that most of us cannot do while we are stuck where we are stuck. Because it would be nice if God tells me, defines greatness for me before I leave. Oh, be me, a great nation means that when you get there, there will be five million people. It makes sense. Five million is not a bad number. It's not, that's not shabby, God. But what happens when he just says to you, I'll show you a land and I'll make you a great nation. I know he's God, he doesn't lie, but give me a little bit more. How do I get to this land? Do they have cucumbers there? Because cucumber is my absolute favorite thing. Will there be people who understand my language when I get there? 
I'm not exactly a fan of culture shocks. All of these conversations we have. But no, none of that happened. What did they say? A land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation there. And I will bless you and make your name great. And that shall be a blessing. I don't even need to say this again because we had ex extensively talked about the blessing. That the blessed man is the only one that carries the blessing. And that you do not get blessed today. You've been blessed already. Praise Jesus. But he said, I'll make your name great. In the Amplified, he says, I'll make you famous and distinguished. And so all of the world is running for famous and distinguished. Not recognizing that it is God that will make you famous and distinguished. So therefore... The definition of famous and distinguished that God is talking about may not be what you think. Praise the Lord. He says, I will make your name, I will bless thee, I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. If you are blessed and you don't become a blessing, God just wasted his time. And God doesn't waste anything. So your assignment ultimately is not to go there and say, I obeyed God, I came. Now let's party. Your assignment is when you get there, you need to recognize that God wants you to be his hands and his feet. He wants you to be his spokesperson. He wants people to say, praise God, just because you lived in that land. Mm -hmm. Verse number three, and I will bless them that bless thee, and cause them that cause set thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I will bless them that bless thee. I will cause them that cause set thee. What more assurance do you want that God is on your case? Even if where he sent you to is a land that he will show you that you don't yet know. One, there is this guarantee that I have. If someone tries to put a curse on me and mine, the curse will go back to them. And then if you bless me, obviously you are blessed. When you understand the scripture and you truly understand it, you don't need to kill demons. You just walk in the confidence that God has said it. I'm aligning with his word. So it is his word. He will be faithful to watch over it and perform it. Praise Jesus. I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. If you are blessed and one, at least one other family cannot say, for your sake, my life is better. Then what use are you to heaven? If one man cannot say, but for you, praise God for your life, it is because of you. Not even so much that you begin to glory, but just so that you know that God is on your case. I ask you again, what use is your life? That should make us stop and think, who am I impacting? Whose life is my life feeding because if you have a life that is not feeding any other life, there is a problem. And I get it. Everybody cannot feed other lives the way I feed other lives. Do you get it? But there are things that, even for those of us seated in this room, there are things you can do that if I try from here till to to Jesus comes, I can't do them. The idea of becoming a blessing, our families of the earth being blessed through us, is not for all, all of us to be clones of each other and do what every other person is doing. It's for you to just be comfortable in your skin, stay in your space, and do what you... So, ultimately, what should happen is, I am a blessing to Abiola, Abiola is a blessing to me. My life is blessed by her, her life is blessed by mine. It is not what we are doing now, that there is a select group of people whose lives bless our other lives. So we line up in front of their house. If you are up not, you know, the Almagiris line up in front of one Alaji. So that Alaji is the blesser. The, what it's supposed to be is that there is a day where the Almagiri is the one that is a blessing to the Alaji. That's the way it works. Every single one of us has something to give. Every single one of us is able to be a blessing. Why? Not because you even um, check, think through it to be a blessing, but because God has called you and he said that in you shall the nations of the earth be blessed. Someone will say, but we're talking about Abraham. In that day, yes, 
This was specifically for Abraham. But today, the word of God, the Bible says, is an example for us. So you can actually look at a word that was sent to, a, sent to a specific person in that time and put yourself in that scenario and it will work for you. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. It says, I, in, you, in you, you shall the, all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham did what? He departed. I want you to underline that in your Bible as I'm doing mine. So Abraham, Abraham departed. You mean he didn't have Call a committee. You mean Abraham didn't run to his pastor? You mean he didn't call prophets this person? He just departed. Why? You know the Bible did not say that Abraham was a prophet, right? Shouldn't he have asked the prophets, do you think this is God? Here's something that I know. I know because I live it by his mercy you can never obey God and get in trouble mm -hmm. see I did not say you cannot obey God and it will be painful mm -hmm. <laughs> I just said you can never obey God and get in trouble and you need to ask me what do I mean by trouble I mean to be denied by the same God you obeyed God doesn't work like that things may not even work out they may throw you in prison but one thing I'm sure is wherever you are God shows up there because he's not limited to the conducive environments that men create from him. What did he say in his word? He said, I do not dwell in buildings that are built with hands. So where God throws me may not be the most convenient place, but he's there with me. In Psalm 23, he says, he says my rod and my staff, they comfort me. God is with us. Praise Jesus. So that was the only, um, what's the word? That's the only understanding I have for God will tell Abraham this thing and will just get up and go. Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. And Lot did what? Went with him. I want you to underline and Lot went with him. When we get into chapter 14 or thereabouts, we shall come back and revisit and Lot went with him. But let me just stop here and talk to you about Lot. Define the word Lot. If you go to your dictionary, Lot is not a name. Lot is a burden. Lot is something that a man should not carry. What was the instruction that Abraham had? Leave your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your father's house. Where did Lot come from? But he took Lot with him. And ultimately, Lot became his Lot because he became a major burden until God in his mercy separated them. I know that traveling alone is not fun. When I live here, I'm going to be traveling a bit. I don't like traveling by road much. Not anymore. But to make that trip, I had to say to someone, go with me. It's just better that you have someone else in the car that you're talking with and stuff like that. So if I'm just going for my, 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 my friend's father's birthday, and I'm looking for someone to go with me, Definitely, I want someone to go with me on this journey to a land that they will show me. That's when I have an address, yet I want someone to go with me. More importantly, I need, some, I need a whole village to go with me because I have no address. So it makes sense that Abraham took with him Lot. The only big problem is that Lot is not as ordinary as it seems. So you want to pause here and ask yourself, where is the Lord? You are carrying them. Nobody sent you. You are carrying them. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. They are symbolic of lots. Lots don't usually look like lots in the beginning. They look like someone to hold your bag. They look like someone to gist with. They look like someone to come home to. Lots take a time. They take a while before they manifest who they truly are. Because the truth of the matter is, if you see Lot for who he is from the beginning, what will happen? You will stay away from him. So Lot is disguised to Wahala that looks like hell. Are you going to go with Lot? Because Abraham was giving very clear instructions. Children of God, we need to be very careful. When you receive your instructions, be very clear. 
If you don't understand your instructions, take time to understand your instructions. We always think that God speaks figuratively. God doesn't speak figuratively. What God says is what he meant. When he says, leave your father's house, he meant leave your father's house. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So he took with him who? Lot. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now if we go back to verse number... Verse number 30 of chapter 11... Do you see that one line there? But Sarah, his wife, was barren. She had no child. I need you to understand that Abraham is obeying not because Abraham had the best kind of life. Abraham wasn't obeying out of the abundance that he had. Abraham wasn't obeying because he, he, everything was hunky-dory. If you have a wife who, is, um, uh, who has an issue with, uh, or with um, conceiving, that's not the time to embark on, a, on, a, on an other's journey to a land they will show you. That's the time to be careful, to settle in one place and do everything that is possible for you to get your children. Do you understand it? But what did Abraham do? He, he got up and he left. How many of us in this room today haven't moved because it's not convenient? Oh Lord, just wait, let my son graduate school. Can I ask you a very critical question? What if your son never graduates? It's not a course, I just ask. It's a simple question. Does that mean you won't go? I heard a story of a man who is um, a missionary somewhere deep inside Ocean State. The man said that early in his life when he got born again, the Lord kept telling him, I'm sending you, leave the town, pack everything, he told him a specific village. Up to now, the village doesn't have a motorable road. I said, that is where I want you to go and do ministry. He said, I just got married. I have a wife. I have children. Even if I, I am confined to this terrible life, what about my children? He didn't move until he was 66. No, 56, sorry, because he's 70 now. Until he was 56. He said the thing that made him finally get up and leave was because all those children that he was having in the town, and he wanted to give them a proper education, none of them was doing well. He said every time he would go to God, the Lord would say to him, you are here doing cathedral, I didn't send you this one. So at 56, he left. If what you are waiting on does not manifest, will you not follow God? Is a question that all of us must answer. If you never marry, will you not follow God? If you never have a child, will you not follow him? God did not say that these are part of, you know, it's not, yes, children are the reward of them that diligently seek him. So, what if he chooses I'm not part of them? I know it's hard to swallow some of this, but the question I'm trying to get us to answer is what will it take? For me to do the will of God. Because you need to know. I found that in going with God. If you don't decide before you get there. You will not get it done. My prayer is we will get it done in Jesus name. Amen. Abraham took Sarai his wife. And Lot his brother's son. And all their substance. That they had gathered. And the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan this came. I need you to stop and think about it. What kind of conversation was Abraham having with these people? And I want you to quickly link it to the Tower of Babel. Do you know why people would follow Abraham? Because all the while they had led that kind of life. From the Tower of Babel, the one thing that ran through is the Pilgrim's Progress song that was sing. This world is not my own. I am just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Do you see it? So you, 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 you know, try, you know, when I, I just got born again, there was something that my pastor used to say a lot. He would say to us, travel light. Because if you are not traveling light, what's going to happen is the tendency to be able to move from that location to the next one will be difficult. And traveling light doesn't mean don't take what you need in the physical. It just means don't be attached to these things. 
So that when you get to the place where they are asking you to move, it will not be, let me go and get my gold. Let me go and get my silver. What we do not leave behind to go with God is a question. We all need to answer it before we get to the point that it will tap us on the shoulder. And I promise you, because I know, if you have, been, if you have to do it for 20 years, the first 18 years, nobody will say thank you to you. As a matter of fact, everybody will murmur. I saw in Acts, in the book of Acts, that scripture scares me. Let me look for it. Hopefully I'll find it. Acts 27, I believe. Verse 16. Oh no, Acts 26, not 27. Verse 16. It says, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Verse number 17 is the part that scares me. It says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I sent thee. That is, the people that we seek to collect your head. Are the exact people that they sent you to go and help. But if you look at the wording of verse 16, and you wanted to paraphrase what God said to Abraham, is that not the conversation? In this shall all the nations be blessed. Is that not what they're saying? There is no guarantee that when you get there, the nations will be so glad to see you. To say, ha, ah, you left everything to come for us. Come, let's make you a king. The first answer, the first thing they will say to you is crucify him. Praise Jesus. What did he send us to go and do? Verse number 18 of Acts chapter 26. To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they what? They may receive forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. Think about it. So if you have not answered the question, if they spit on me, I will continue to go. When someone is trying to spit, you will go back. And you know the funny thing? God will not hold the one that was trying to spit accountable. It's you. Because the idea is you ought to know that part spitting is part of the job. They are just coming. They don't know anything. Their own is in front for them. But you already know. So what did you do with it? Praise Jesus. And Abraham passed through, verse number 6, the land, unto the place of Shechem, and unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanites was then in the land. Can you see that he left his country, but where they prepared for him was not even empty. For those of us who think that because God told me to go, when I get there, they will just open their treasures, they will open their central bank, and they will say, come and collect you, came, praise God, do they will resist you. Who wants to give up his land? That's why if, when we read further, which we will not read today, you will see that part of what God told him, Abraham eventually, when he turned to him, look, as far as your eyes can see, was he told Abraham, walk the length and the breadth of the land. The promised land is not a land that they will just open the gate and say, welcome. You can see it in that Jericho was straightly shut in. You can see that I defeated Joshua and the people. The promised land is not empty. We usually think that the promised land is empty. I just go there and I, I, I hoist my flag. No, you only hoist a flag when you have defeated the enemies in that land. So there is nothing that God is calling us to that is easy. But again, I want you to answer the question. What is too difficult that I will not answer what God is asking me to do? And most of us are thinking, well, is she talking about, let me go and preach in Iraq? That's even easier because you already know that 80% of the probabilities, they will take your head. So that's easy to settle. But that's not what I'm saying. They can ask you to leave where not, they, and, and, and off at any agents now. They can ask you to leave off at any agents and go to um, Abu Lebe. And what your eye will see will be worse than somebody who went to Iraq, what they saw. It's no big deal. Because you need to recognize that God is the owner of our lives. 
and he will not send you a letter if he wants to get you to go. There was a year that all that God told me to do was take care of this couple in my house. That day they had sent me to Iraq. That year they had sent me to Iraq. I would have gladly gone. It was a couple. The husband was a pastor. They were living in my guest house, in my guest room. It was, so it was not supposed to be hard. These were people that would wake up in the morning and would pray together. It was not supposed to be difficult. I tell you, by the time it was six months, eh, I was praying that God would send me on missionary journey. Because if I had gone and I had to write home to say people send me money for food, it would have been better. And God told me, if you say pen, I will deal with you. So I didn't even have to separate from everybody. Right there in my house, God was working the work of separation in me. So when we're talking about God calling us and saying go, nothing may change. You may still be in your country. You may still be amongst your kindred. You may still be in your father's house. But who you are in your core is no longer who you used to be with them. Praise Jesus. Amen. So the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, verse number 7, Unto thy seed will I give the land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Did you notice verse number 7? This is the time Abraham should have gone back. Unto thy seed will I give the land. What do me? Oh, you mean you brought me all this distance? So tell me about a seed. Remember Abraham doesn't have a child yet. This God is not serious. Let me go back where I'm coming from. Unto my seed, go. How can you not, how will you not say unto my seed when I don't have a child? So that tomorrow you say it's because I don't have a seed. That's why you didn't give us the land. He was already 75. If I had seed, then maybe it makes sense. But even when I have seed, it would have been nice that you gave it to me. Let me hand it over to them. Why is it that it's my seed you want to give it to? The details of the call and never as rosy as you think when you are watching Facebook Live and you see me. You think my life is all together. There's nothing doing me. I wish. Praise Jesus. He says, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar. They told him, it's enough to worship God. Unto my seed. Okay, Lord. Let me just cook my just. Because this one now, we don't even know what you're saying anymore. Verse number 8. And he removed from hence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed, going on, for, on still toward the south. Praise Jesus. It's in verse 9 we're going to stop today. Why we stop in verse 9 is that the tone of the conversation in, top, in verse 10 changes. The events are different. So today what we looked at was how Abraham took off. And why we looked at it the way we looked at it is so that you too will take a look at it and go back home and plot how you will take off. Because ultimately God doesn't call us to ordinary. But before extraordinary, we show forth. We have to do so many mundane things that people will be wondering. Hello, day. Maybe you called me and I show. Shouldn't my wife just have twins? After all, you said you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. So what did I do? I need us to see that in God, God. It, 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 if you understand the sovereignty of God, to know that he doesn't owe you any explanation, neither does he owe you any apologies. And to still recognize that as he's not explaining to you and he's not apologizing, your life is still better off with him than any other life you can imagine. When you come to that understanding, then you have started to answer. How long was this journey? We don't know. He has built two altars already. 
Because when you get in a place like this, the only thing you do consistently is worship because you can't tell what else will happen. So you worship sometimes, not because you even feel like worship. You just worship to, so that God will know you are still here. Because for a while, you have not even heard his voice anymore. But you worship again. Say, Lord, I'm still here. I'm still loyal. I'm still obeying. It looks like you have moved, but I'm here. Where you left me, I'm still there. And there is no guarantee that he would respond. But the truth of the matter is that there is no life better than that life where you are exactly where heaven wants you to be. Praise Jesus. So we see that a journey has begun that will culminate in two million people being taken into slavery for 400 years plus 30 extra before they will come back to this land of Canaan. You begin to see that this has triggered something that if someone had attempted to describe to Abraham, Abraham would never have believed. So when you see it like that, you need to quickly begin to think about your life and begin to ask yourself, what does God have planned for me that I'm only looking at the tip of the iceberg and I'm thinking, whoa. Sometimes I won't go to show it all to me at once. So that I can pack the right ammunition on this journey. Other times I am so grateful. Most of the time actually I am grateful he didn't show me. Because if he had shown me I would not have come. How exactly will I know that when the people I come that I was sent to. Will be my trouble. Then I will still go. I don't need them for anything. So why? Sometimes when you read it, it sounds like a small trouble. It's no big deal. So you say, well, whatever it is, let's see how we can take it. You get that it was no small trouble at all. Let me explain it to you. John the Baptist, the people, they, he was dead, dead, dead in heaven. They sent him. His mother had given up on having children. They said, go. He was so excited that he was going to be walking with the Savior of the world. He had not given back to him. He was jumping in the tummy. When the day came, that he was to be beheaded, or just before he was beheaded, he sent a word to that same person, the savior of the world, that he knew without a shadow of doubt was the savior of the world, because he knew why he was in the womb. He said, are you the one, or should we look for another? Does that tell you something? It does tell me a lot. No wonder the Bible says that the race is not to the swift. Absolutely nothing matters but the obedience that we saw is more important. And that's why when you receive, when you are called to do anything, it doesn't matter on, in what arena or what it is. It doesn't have to be big and it doesn't, there's nothing that is too little that God has called you to do. You must get to the point where you, you are submitted and you know you are working with God because, ah, have you ever tried to cry and there was no word there were no words you couldn't even make a sound but your heart was bleeding the tears that your heart was were shedding was shedding was not water tears it was blood and yet when you finish that you will get up get up you wash your face you dressed up you oil your head and you will go and be strong for another person. So what do we say to these things? Nothing else but the fact that God knows what he's doing. I stopped trying to be smart a long time ago in trying to understand but I just get up. Anyone he shows me today is, didn't he say sufficient for the day? I just take that sufficiently for that day. If he wants to show me more, fine. If he doesn't want to show me, you know, there was a year that all that, there was, in fact, the, for like three years, I preached only from one scripture. From Genesis chapter one. And I did not teach the same message twice. There was a whole year he kept me in Psalm 84. 
and I never woke up in the morning and thought I now know it all because I couldn't say that I up to now I still don't understand all of that sound. This journey is a journey of a walk with God. Just one step, one foot in front of the other, going in faith, trusting in your heart, not in the circumstances, but in the fact that the God that has called you, he does know what he's doing. The question is, will you trust him? Abraham left it all. Not quite. I like Genesis a lot because you will see what it means to do 100% obedience. You will see what happens when you do 99.9% .9 obedience. You will see when you do 1%. You will see when you don't do at all. I like the word of God because it doesn't mean words. It's just direct. God is not ashamed of when his children fail. So he records it so that all of us will learn. God doesn't want us to. It's not a journey of everything needs to be perfect. It's a journey of I am God and I call the shots. That's what all of this is about. My prayer is that we will not be left by God in the name of Jesus. So what is the conclusion of the whole matter? Why did the, uh, the preacher man say it? Fear God and keep his commandment. That's the conclusion of the entire entirety of what I'm saying now. There are no guarantees how this will pan out. But however it pans out, you need to know that God saw it from the beginning and yet he led you into it. The Bible says he leaded us besides tea with waters. He restored our soul. Will you let God take you on the journey of your life? Because you may be thinking, ah, Abraham, ah, if it was me, ah. But nothing is as powerful as what Abraham would go through and his children and his children's children and more after them. As topsy-turvy as the journey will end up becoming, I'm sure if you could see, if you find Abraham in heaven and you ask him, will you do it again? He will tell you in the drop of a heart. My prayer is that grace will be packed into us in Jesus' name. Amen. My prayer is that we will never be late in obeying God in Jesus' Amen. name. Because in God, what it is that he expects is obedience. And what I, when I talk about obedience... <coughs> I'm talking about your default mode. It's not your, what's the other word? What's the, uh, um, the technical word? I'm not saying when they install stuff into you. Default mode is factory setting. Your factory setting ought to be obedience. Not considered obedience. Not discussed obedience. But obedience. God will bless you. Actually, you're blessed already. Your blessings will manifest. And when the Lord speaks to you, you will hear. You will not miss him in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining the class today. I'll see you next week. If Jesus tarries. Bye-bye.